Hi class, we are working on week 14 and we're getting close to the end. Um, this, this week we're talking about things or I'm discussing things from your adult um, treatment planner, our aging adult treatment planner. Um, there's a lot of topics in this week so I don't know if I'll be able to get through them all. I'll try to hit on points of each one. Um, just a reminder, continue to work on your capstone, the brochure. I sent you that example of a brochure. Um, it can look however you so choose. I, I want you to embrace being creative, um, but it may look more like a pamphlet just because there is so much information that you need to include in the brochure. Um, I wanted to reiterate again um, how I much I appreciate you guys being open and honest in your discussion boards. I really appreciate the authenticity and how much time and energy you're putting into this. So I, I want to congratulate you and thank you again and hopefully you guys are gaining a lot of information on how to work with the aging population through this course and the information you've read and, and what you guys have done as far as your own research. Um, hopefully it will be applicable to you in your future and as you practice. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the major concern with an aging population of uh, just making sure that their medication or medical issues are being resolved. Um, that's one of the topics as unresolved medical issues. And that's something to be mindful of because there's, there's some long-term consequences if someone isn't getting their medication or their medical problems taken care of. And we as clinicians have to always, like we talk about, we always have to refer out that's outside of our scope. But Oftentimes people aren't paying attention. When I say people, I mean people maybe sometimes in the medical profession, a pharmacist isn't maybe paying attention to all these different doctors prescribing a bunch of different meds. It could be causing some um, dementia type symptoms or it could be causing mood problems or maybe the person hasn't been educated and although they're not feeling pain any longer, they're still taking their pain meds. Um, things of that nature and we need to be mindful to kind of know how to instruct our clients to who to ask or who to talk to and we never want to necessarily instruct them to just stop taking something because we don't know the consequences of that. Some of these medications you can't just stop taking like cold turkey. So it's good for us as clinicians to be mindful of these things and to kind of ask questions or get authorizations to release information and maybe talk to a to talk to a doctor or talk to um, somebody that can maybe help them and instruct them to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. Um, memory impairment, um, you know, sometimes medications can cause memory impairment and just quickly going into there, we talked about memory loss in, in the aging population a lot, I feel like this past semester and um, something we need to be mindful of with memory impairment, that can be due to a medical condition outside of just like someone maybe having Alzheimer's or something. Yes, it's very easy generically to say that it's part of aging, but it's more than it's just part of aging. Um, there could be, you know, um, something going on with diabetes. There could be something going on maybe with um, oxygen to their brain where they're not full, functioning at full capacity. And we would never want to just say, oh, it's no big deal. That happens to everybody. You know, we need to take these kinds of things seriously. You know, we might have to um, get an outside person involved, someone from their lives, especially if they're having a hard time keeping up with the day-to-day -day tasks of, you know, paying bills, bathing, cleaning, like they're remembering very simple things. We might need to get some support from somebody else. So again, it's important to be mindful of that. Um, nutritional deficits. This could be, again, an adult protective, you know, issue in the sense that someone, you know, if an aging adult is depending on someone to cook their food and someone's not pro cooking them the proper nutrition, this could be something that would be reportable. So it's important to be mindful of that. Someone going through severe weight loss and hasn't necessarily, maybe they're responsible for their own eating. So maybe they, it could be a monetary issue and that might be something that needs to be addressed and we need to help them with maybe trying to find services where they can get outside financial support. Maybe it's something like um, they can't cook because of, you know, whatever medical problems they have going on. Um, maybe they um, are thinking they're eating, they're not eating, um, you know, maybe someone's neglecting them, um, you know, maybe they're so sad or so um, upset that they can't eat. But if we're recognizing that an aging adult or any adult is losing weight very rapidly and it's not because of um, a weight loss plan or weight loss management, it's always something for any client to address and wonder what the heck's going on. Um, you know, maybe someone's always had an eating disorder and now you're able to see it for the first time. Whatever it may be, it's important as we as clinicians don't ignore those things and that we address them. So again, something to be important because nutrition plays a big factor in how overall a person feels and how 
um, it affects you on a day-to-day. -day. Um, it's important that we have the proper nutrients so we can manage to um, live and have energy and do the things that we need to do. So that's important. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder. I feel like this is one that, you know, if this could be an issue that's never been addressed. And then as a person ages, I feel like uh, anxiety and worry um, just plays into an aging adult. And there's a lot more things to worry about. I think of many aging adults that I know or I have known through other people um, worry a lot about finances. Um, a lot of it being part of the fact that they are from, you know, maybe the era of the Great Depression or whatever it may be, and um, they um, worry about money all the time, and so it becomes an obsession. Do they still have it? Is it still there if they need it? Um, are they going to have the resources that they need to take care of themselves? And so they get fixated on something and think about it and think about it think about it. A lot of this, like, again, tying into things that we work, looked at before, again, addressing, like, you know, these are building blocks. So if we think of things we talked about before as far as how an aging adult has more time on their hands potentially because they're no longer working and so that means they have more time to think, they have more time to worry, they have more time to obsess whether it's about unresolved family issues or maybe their safety or maybe very real issues but it's, they take it to like the 10th degree and that's something as clinicians we need to be aware of and be conscientious of because this could be um, life altering potentially for an aging adult and very debilitating. And we need to make sure that um, we're being mindful of that and addressing those things so that we can help them um, the best that we can. Um, so it's important that, that these kinds of things get dealt with, whether it be like you make a referral for a psychiatrist or a general you know, practitioner, or we work through cognitive behavioral type things such as addressing irrational thinking, our thoughts turns in our turn into our behaviors, which turn into our beliefs. But you know, sometimes with OCD, it's not so simple to just turn it off. So we may need to help them with some outside support, make sure they're talking to people. And again, this flows right back into agoraphobic Glorophobia and phob panic. You know, um, you know. Sometimes when when an older person is so afraid of everything in the outside world because it's so different or whatever it may be, they really isolate themselves and become quite um, agoraphobic and and don't want to leave the house and are scared about everything and nervous. I remember it was kind of a joke in our family. The older people, it was like as soon as the sun set, they wanted to go home. So it's something that um, I think a lot of older people struggle with because there's this there's a safety net wherever they they live or they feel comfortable. Not saying that's a bad thing. That's great that they feel comfortable there, but it can be very isolating. And this again gives you more time to worry and to think about everything else that you can't control. And that's not necessarily good for a person. And so these are kinds of things that they have to address. Granted, if the person's agoraphobic, this may be where we address some like we we try some new modalities of therapy. Whether we do something over the phone, we meet we we are willing to go to their house, assuming you feel safe, because a person who's agoraphobic, I don't know if you can get them to your office. Um, or it could be that they only feel it in certain moments, so maybe it's addressing other issues. Whatever it may be, we might have to be more creative in our approach of therapy because, like, again, the person doesn't want to leave. Um, and again, it's based on what your comfort level is and what you feel comfortable with, but that's just something to be mindful of. An agoraphobic person may not want to really leave their house, clearly. Um, and so you might have to use a new type of par uh, therapy. Um, paranoid ideation. Um, this is something, again, I think it kind of goes along the lines of, you know, there's a lot of time, a lot of things to worry about. You watch the news, it's absolutely terrible, and things are very different than they were 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago. And sometimes this can be really hard for an older person to understand and resolve, too. Um, and so, you know, some things could be co coming up. You know, there could be social phobias that are coming up. Um, Again, there could be issues with um, their medical, their medical, um, their health. So that could be causing some paranoia. Um, you know, when someone's maybe lived a very rough life, let's say they've been in a gang their whole life, and then all of a sudden they're out of that world, but they still remember having to always um, watch their back and. Um, always worried about what's going to happen now that they don't have to live that way, live in fear all the time maybe. Now they're kind of paranoid of everybody and they don't trust anyone. Um, so these are the kinds of things that could come up from an older person. Um, it could, like I said, could be due to, you know, an adverse reaction to medication. Maybe they're developing schizophrenia. Um, you know, maybe someone's been a drug user, they get off drugs. These are some side effects, things of that nature, you know. Um, it could be a, a sign or symptom of dementia, things to explore. But um, 
it's definitely not something that should be ignored. You know, again, you might have to get um, caretakers involved um, and really address some of these things because it's not healthy for a person to just be living this way and you never know maybe if a person's in a paranoid state what, what may happen. So just to be mindful of that. Um, going into now persistent pain, um, this is just the reality with some illnesses, there's just is gonna be constant pain. And when someone's in pain all the time, they clearly don't feel very good. Um, which could affect their overall mood, their overall demeanor, um, dealing with the fact that, um, you know, um, they can't do what they want to do, you know, assuming it's legitimate pain. Some people, you know, they, they have so much stuff going on in their lives that it comes out as pain. I mean, that sounds kind of bizarre, but it happens for people. And so maybe trying to figure out what are the underlining issues that are causing this pain or this hurt that they feel so terribly. You know, you could have something, somebody doing something that's fictitious, um, you know, that isn't necessarily, um, maybe they're not realizing that they're lying, but they're making it up for attention or whatever. So there might be a lot of things to explore with this particular problem. Um, or this person's always sick or something's always wrong with them. And it's just this need to kind of never be well. Um, so yes, maybe sometimes some access to could be going on here. Again, though, it could be legitimate pain and dealing with the reality that they're going to be in pain and how is that going to rule their life or what do we need to do to make sure they're on a healthy pain management schedule, whatever that may be. So as a therapist, of course, always consulting uh, maybe with their physician because it might be help you to understand what they're going through, but never to make medical you know, suggestions for them, but just maybe asking if you can speak with a physician or a doctor, or maybe even seeing um, if, you know, referring them to make sure to go to see somebody so that they can deal with this particular issue. Um, sometimes from a psychotherapy standpoint, you know, there's things like EMDR, which can help with pain reduction. You know, there might be other things like going to a chiropractor or physical therapist or someone that can help them as well with pain. Um, and lastly, you know, is phobias, and I, and I don't mean to be so generic when I say a lot of these tie together, and not to be overly um, general with the aging population, but so often they have so much time on their hands, and, and, you know, when they're just sitting and thinking, you know, I'm not talking about the, maybe the active elderly person who's giving back to the community, who's volunteering, who's trying to make the most of whatever time that they have left on this earth. So I'm talking about sometimes the people who are just sitting here and they're just thinking all day long. Um, it could cause them to kind of be obsessive over some things and give them phobias, whether that's going outside, whether that's traveling, anything outside their control. Because right now, like all they can control is what they do or don't do. And so um, there's some safety in that. And so anything outside of that might be very scary and might be very fearful for them and really be very de debilitating. So as a clinician, we need to be mindful and sensitive to those things and maybe also encourage them and challenge them and maybe push them to go outside those boundaries. You know, maybe this is the first time in their lives they're dealing with a significant trauma that they've experienced and now they're dealing with it and now the ramifications of dealing with the trauma is causing some phobia. And you know, what a, what a great time in a person's life now that they have the time to actually deal with things um, and, and it's healthy for them to deal with it, but there might be some consequences with dealing with things. And, and that's for anyone, but, you know, helping them come to a place where they can be at peace and live their life to their fullest. I mean, as, as a clinician, we want all of our clients to live their lives to their fullest. So just these things are good to be mindful of. And again, I think a lot of them connect. Um, you know, maybe they go back to a root of anxiety or they go back to a root of depression, but they do connect. And I can't reiterate enough how much it is, how important it is to make the appropriate referrals um, for any of your clients, but especially for the aging clients, just because of where they're at and how, what a volatile state they're in, um, potentially. So I hope this information is helpful. I look forward to seeing you next week and have a great night. Thanks.